Vladimir Putin has dropped a bombshell. And all it took was him holding up a few documents. Well, these documents seem to show that Ukraine agreed to a peace deal over a year ago, but never held up their end of the bargain. Now, we've been reporting this for months because of reports that when Boris Johnson went to Ukraine, he was going there to thwart peace talks. That now seems to have borne out. Uh, at the time, it was called that conspiracy. That out instead of borne out. It was Boris out. It was Boris out. At the time, it was called conspiracy theory. No, he was just there to show support for Ukraine. Well, no, what he was there to do was to thwart the peace deal, which now the timeline seems to support. So let's go over it. Russian President Vladimir Putin said that he was showing us a copy of a peace agreement that was signed by Ukraine last year when peace talks were hosted in Turkey. It was called the Treaty on Permanent Neutrality and Security Guarantees of Ukraine. Uh, these were talks held in Turkey in March of 2022. Uh, what happened to them? Well, Boris Johnson happened to them. Uh, Bojo hopped on a plane a few days later, and Ukrainian media reported that he talked Zelensky out of it. U.S. officials would quickly follow suit after yeah. this visit. Uh, we would see Nancy Pelosi clicking her heels down the streets of Kiev, Antony Blinken, Lloyd Austin. Uh, Europe's Ursula von der Leyen showed up not long after that. And then, consequently, what did Ukraine do? They reneged on their side of the bargain, according to President Putin. Here is a translated video of President Putin showing this document to a group of African leaders and watch the sort of consternation on their faces as they see this. We did not agree with the Ukrainian side that this deal would be confidential, but we also never disclosed it or commented on it. The draft of this agreement was initialed by a representative of the head of the negotiating group from Kiev. He put his signature there. Here it is. Wow. It's called the Treaty on Permanent Neutrality and Guarantees for the Security of Ukraine. It contains 18 articles and there is also an appendix. Its provisions concern the armed forces and many other things. Everything is written there, down to units of military equipment and personnel of the armed forces. Here is the document. It is initialed. But after we withdrew troops from Kiev as promised, the Kiev authorities, as their patrons usually do, threw it all into the wastebasket of history. Where are the guarantees that they will not continue to abandon such agreements? It's crazy. And did you see one of the African leaders of this, this St. Petersburg summit sitting with his mouth open? He was like, yeah, what? Wait a minute. They signed a peace agreement. Right. And then, of course, you'll know right afterwards. And part of the peace agreement was for Russia to remove its forces from Kiev. Well, take a look at this next slide, because, yes, this was part of the deal. They said that their side was to withdraw from Kiev. But here's NPR telling us that they were withdrawing from Kiev as Moscow focuses more on eastern Ukraine. Uh, so, you know, this was from, uh, can you see the date there? I mean, we saw all kinds of talking heads saying they're retreating just weeks into the battle. They're retreating. See, they're right? leaving Kiev. The ghost of Kiev got them. They're leaving. Like they're they're leaving. winning. That's what we were told. <laughs> now, it, I want to go back to this throwing it all into the wastebasket of history bit because President Putin said Russia withdrew troops from Kiev after this treaty because that was part of their bargain. The treaty outlined neutrality for Ukraine, maximum allowances for military personnel and equipment, and listed Russia, the U.S., Britain, China, and France as guarantors. Now, when one side reneges on their peace agreement and throws it into the wastebasket of history, how many lives then go into that with it? A lot. How many, right? Since then, if you think about it, like if you were someone whose family has been lost since March of 2022, and you think it could have been over then, this uh, well, what's about, it all for? Well, think about how many Ukrainians have been killed as a result of this in the meat grinder, right? So Ukrainians are being destroyed in this latest battle overnight. 50% of the troops on the Ukraine side were wiped out, destroyed. One out of every 10 uh, according to Vladimir Putin, one in 10 Russian soldiers for every one they're losing, uh, for every 10 Ukraine is losing, Russia's losing one. So lives are being lost on both sides, way more dramatically on the Ukrainian side. Absolutely devastating. You're wiping out an entire generation 
of people, an entire generation. And then you've wiped out that generation, and then you've gone to the younger and older generations to fill the ranks, grab, grabbing them out of college classrooms and grabbing young men off the streets who don't even meet the qualification age, and then taking 60-year-olds to be a part of the tree. Like, you're wiping out everyone, Boris Johnson well, and the West. And I kind of feel like we, you know, Putin has been very patient during this because everything they have done has been a provocation. Everything Ukraine has done to him has been a provocation and he could have done what the U.S. would have done, which is decimated Ukraine. Shock like, and awe. If, if it was the U.S., yeah, if it was mm -hmm. the U.S. that, that was this was d being done to, mm -hmm. Ukraine would be leveled by now. Yeah, shock and awe campaign, right? And so well, it's like is... sadly methodical and it's like going to drag mm -hmm. on and on and on. Yes, but this is something that Putin has been criticized inside Russia for the last 15 years or more is to continue to have faith that Ukraine will be a trusted partner back as far back as 2014 when he extended the 14 billion, I think it was 14 billion euro loan uh, to Ukraine as good faith to sort of support their economy, even though many inside of Russia didn't want him to do that. Well, he, he, he thought admitted that he had to do it in order to sort of bolster that economy and bolster their independence so that they could continue to be uh, independent and resist NATO um, lure. Right. Well, and he also, of course, extended and said he would support the Minsk agreements. Right. So and he admitted this was one of it, maybe his great mistakes. He said, I believe them. And we now know from Angela Merkel that they never had any intention of supporting the Minsk agreements. So you know, fool me once, right? Yeah. Right. Now, back to this narrative that we were told, because if this is true and we are being told we had a peace agreement, our agreement was this withdraw from Kiev. They were going to do that and they didn't do that. But we did this. What we were told when they held up their part of the bargain was that, oh, look, Russia's retreating. They can't take Kiev. They're not even going to try. Ukraine is too strong. Here is NATO head Jen Stoltenberg said this about that in March of 2022, as soon as Russia was withdrawing, saying we've heard the recent statements that Russia will scale down military operations around Kiev and in northern Ukraine. But Russia has repeatedly lied about its intentions. So we can only judge Russia on its actions, not its words. According to our intelligence, Russian units are not withdrawing, but repositioning. Russia is trying to regroup, resupply, and reinforce its offensive in the Donbass region. At the same time, Russia maintains pressure on Kiev and other cities so we can expect additional offensive actions, bringing even more suffering. So was NATO out of the loop on this peace agreement, or did they know and they were just spinning a yarn to us? Well, of course, they That's absolutely weird, right? knew. They absolutely they know everything. They know everything. They know that they were meeting to to discuss peace. And then he, and Zelensky was fielding phone calls. He's like, I'm at the, I can't talk right now. I can't talk right now. I'm at the peace table right now. I can't talk. No, Vladimir, Vladimir, you you please take our phone calls. So he was sitting at the peace table in Turkey. Right. They knew where he was. They knew exactly what Not was going where on. he was. What I'm saying is, oh, NATO didn't know why you why Moscow was withdrawing from Kiev. They oh, didn't know. I mean, that's again, weird. It's ridiculous. Right? They know that they know every detail of the peace agreement. And so, yeah, they're pretending that they don't know about this. Right. Or is it what it appears to be that Russia had negotiated this deal? The West got wind of it and talked Ukraine out of it and spun the rest of us a lie. Um, I read this quote this weekend in a biography of Julian Assange. It said, if lies can be started, if war can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. Um, so, you know, we've yeah. been lied to about this war in Ukraine. That seems to be self-evident. Now, Ukrainian President Zelensky says that no peace agreement is even on the table uh, because Ukraine wants to retake Crimea, which voted to join Russia in 2014 um, and the Donbass region which asked Russia to intervene on their behalf last year and voted last year to join Russia. So again, I just want to turn back to the map of the conflict. This was updated today showing Ukraine's counteroffensive has not been able to retake much of these regions. Now, again, from the gray line, the dark gray line and over to the right is the contested area. Those areas asked Russia to intervene because Ukraine has been bombing them for over a decade. Russia came in with military forces in March of 2022. They are controlling everything that's in the red. They don't yet control what's in the green, but those are the regions that want to join Russia. Now, look at the blue dots here. Because Ukraine has not really been able to make much territory gain on this counter offensive, they're attacking 
outside of this contested region, see the blue dots above, above um, in, in the, the top, top right? right Those are not contested territories. They are Ukraine on the bottom, Russia on the top. Why are they attacking inside of Russia? The, this sort of negates the whole use of the term counter offensive, right? They're not countering anything. Russia was never there inside of Ukraine. This was always uncontested Russian land. You can't use counter offensive for this. That's a great point. For 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 this kind of battle, if you're attacking up there. Right. Of course, they could justify that they're being they're cutting off the pincer that's coming from the top down, of course. Right. They can use that argument. And as Patrick Lancaster has been reporting here for us on Redacted, he's been in Belgorod. He's been in that area, that uncontested area in the north. So those blue dots at the top, that's where uh, Patrick has been. No other Western media, of course, has been there covering that. And you can see where the Ukrainian forces and NATO forces using NATO weapons have gone into that region. Yeah, this is one of the reasons I'm so committed to just continuing to follow this map. Um, because I think in the West, we just sort of are told, oh, there's a fight. It's all over Ukraine. It's not. It's for one region. And this one region has voted to become a part of Russia. And Ukraine is just throwing lives at it in order to keep this part of Ukraine, which they've been torturing for a decade. So who now wants to support this when we have a better sense of what it is? Now, Russia's uh, confirming that they continue to be shelled inside their own borders. Today, the Russian uh, Belgorod region was shelled by the Ukrainian army um, with over 500 shells, according to the mayor of one town. Ukraine now says that they have retaken eight towns in that contested region in the last two weeks. But how many lives has this cost? Uh, Russia says that Ukraine has lost at least 800 servicemen, 20 tanks, four infantry fighting vehicles, and 15 armored vehicles over the weekend alone. Now, once again, Ukraine is trying to take territory that Russia, that asked Russia to come in and intervene, this Donbass region. And the Western media knew this at one point. Take a look at this Time Magazine article from 2014. Uh, many Ukrainians want Russia to invade. This is a Time article. That one, yes. Many Ukrainians want Russia to invade. This is from 2014. Uh, you know, the Western media is pretending not to know this now. Wait, let me, so let me read the first nut of this Simon Schuster article here. To many in Ukraine, a full-scale Russian military invasion would feel like a liberation, according to Time magazine. On Saturday, across the country's eastern and southern provinces, hundreds of thousands of people gathered to welcome the Kremlin's talk of protecting pro-Russian Ukrainians against the revolution that brought a new government to power last week. And we should point out, of course, that new government that was brought to power was a Western puppet government, a NATO Western puppet government. Yes. Don't forget that. Yes. Um, so, again... The Western media is pretending not to remember this because of what Noam Chomsky calls manufactured consent, because they need to ignore truths because they're tied to a government agenda, um, in this case, a war agenda. And, you know, I think it's just interesting how we continue to sort of be dumped on this anti-Russian propaganda in order to want to look away from the truth. Um, and that comes in all forms, like Russophobia around athletes around Russian products, around Russian anything, dressing, whatever. Um, and this morning, you know, I'm always on the lookout for it. Like, what am I being manipulated to not like or to turn against in order to be more willing to swallow some BS, some like neocon pro-war BS, right? And so I came across this article today in The Telegraph saying that Kremlin officials turned to heavy drinking to cope with war stress. And I highlighted at the bottom, and I know that's hard to see on your screen and I apologize, but like this, oh, look at Vladimir Putin. He must be drunk to be doing everything that he's doing because he's a madman. But then the subtitle of the picture says, Vladimir Putin pictured in 2016 um, is known not to be a heavy drinker. <laughs> Like in some, okay. so the headline is Kremlin officials are getting drunk because they're so stressed and they then, can't deal with this. But so then they you have, have to, to read the drunks. then you have to read the fine print. Uh, Putin uh, doesn't drink, uh, so it just totally negates. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Just like the Nord Stream pipeline picture, where it's like him in that bubble that looked like a scene from Despicable Me. Like here he goes, like he's to going to under the, the Nord ocean Stream pipeline. But yeah. again, we have to wonder, what are we fed to hate in order to want to swallow their narrative? That's the question I leave you with. 
Well, yeah, and as someone in the chat just said, why don't we see this on CNN? Why don't we see this on Fox? It's a great question because the mainstream media won't cover this, right? It is manufactured consent. Yeah. They, those, those organizations, CNN, Fox, and all the big media, mainstream media benefit tremendously, tremendously from the war. They, they're, and of course, their backers are billionaires who are making billions of dollars off of this war. So they do not want the war to go away. They absolutely don't want peace. This is why you won't see it on CNN. You won't see it on Fox. You won't see it on MSNBC at yeah. all. I was reading an article from 2014 by Gilbert Doctorow, um, and he was making the case that being pro-Putin is actually more of a patriot, a U.S. patriot, than anyone else who's telling you this Putin is a madman line because he thinks had the U.S. cooperated with Russia, um, he would have been the biggest ally in national security for the U.S. had we not decided to use him as a... Uh... Well, he asked to be a member of NATO. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. people forget, like, Russia solicited to become part of like, NATO. We didn't have to have these wars. It, they're serving someone, but not anyone who's on this program right now, I would wager. And, and we give you this information. You can take it how you want. He's holding up a document. You, you can you can may argue that the document's fake. Maybe the peace agreement was totally fake. He's sitting there in front of 20 African leaders and he's holding up a fake document, perhaps. Or but the timeline bears out. That's why, because he did leave, uh, he did, because they did withdraw from Kiev at the time. Right. Because Western leaders did show up days later because the conflict was extended. And then a few months later, Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Zelensky then puts into Ukrainian law that's forbidding to go to peace, peace talks, talks with right. Russia. Right. So it all the, the timeline bears it out. So if you believe the opposite of that, that this is a fake document, that they blew up their own Nord Stream pipeline and that Putin goes under sea in, un, un, in little submarines and blows up pipelines like that's probably part of the same narrative. Uh, while while drunk, while drunk, he's since, drunk submarine. Since 2016, driving. he's been drunk. <laughs> he's been known to be a drunk submariner. <laughs> I get okay. my vodka and I go under the ocean. And I blow vodka. up pipelines. Um, yeah. It's amazing. By the way, just as a side note, did you see the new the new strategy around Ukraine, which is now they fully blamed Ukraine for the Nord Stream pipeline bombing. Mean, we know it was the United States and the CIA that's been confirmed, right? But but the Western the Washington D.C. narrative now is that it was Ukraine. Oh, and it was and it was a Ukrainian. It was you you know a Ukrainian general who's since been killed. So now we're blaming the dead guy. Like, oh, he's not allowed to, to defend himself anymore. It was definitely him. He's the one that carried out the bombing. We warned them not to do it. We told them not to do it. But, they, you know, they just went and did it anyway. No, that's a total lie. Yeah, and, that's and the generals, generals, being, uh, generals being notorious for, uh, for not asking anybody about major combat operations. Like, they're, they're, right. just, they're always this rogue. <laughs> like, I mean, are they saying that Ukraine has rogue generals? Because the that didn't work well for Japan in the uh, World War II, having rogue generals. So yeah, we get that under control. And thank God he's dead because he was yeah he was definitely an, uh, a bad apple. So this is the spin now that we're giving. It's like it was a rogue general who didn't. I mean, this but is how how did he get access to naval equipment? Apparently, it was a yacht. He had his eyes on a yacht that he was going to retrofit. That's the story. That he there was a massive yacht that they were going to use. Um, I think from a seized Russian oligarch. Was and that's it Gru from Despicable Me? Right. <laughs> let's ask. Let's also, ask Russell Brand. Also, he could steal the moon. Also, that's also ridiculous. he was a also he was a shipwright, so he just happened to be a general and a shipwright. So we retrofitted <laughs> this yacht to, for <laughs> military <laughs> operations. Like this guy was amazing. He knew how to do it all. It's amazing. <laughs> and what's sad is this is the stuff that the Washington Post will print in newspapers or CNN will put on their air, and then you know stupid people will gobble it up, and that's how. That's how it works.